finance. I'm also co-host of the Barstool Breakfast Morning Show on Sirius Radio Channel 85 weekdays from 7 to 9 a.m. So I've been up here for 15 seconds and I just threw in a little plug. <laughs> uh, he was right. I've been with a bunch of uh, shops. I was on the American and New York Stock Exchange. I was at J.P. Morgan. I was at uh, ICAP, SunTrust, uh, Canaccord Genuity, and Citigroup. Um, so I've been around. But with the direction my life has taken in the past year, uh, those stops have become less and less important. Um, there's hopefully going to be some pictures corresponding if I can do PowerPoint correctly. This person. <laughs> <laughs>
words that I cannot say while I'm up here. <laughs> just to show you how rebellious I am, one of them was Felicio. <laughs>
hardly knew me when he initially led the charge to have me speak here before. And the cowardly nature of the rest of the board made sense that it would be Alan who would approach me again. I say that Alan was instrumental in me leaving the industry for two reasons. Having a near stranger, one, having a near stranger appreciate your work so much that they thought I could entertain a group of even more strangers gave me confidence that maybe my writings were more than uh, profane or shocking. Maybe there was something that was truly entertaining. And two, the success of the convention that year created a friendship between Alan and I. You could almost say that even though he went out on a limb to bring me here, my absolutely stellar performance put me in a position of power where Alan owed me one going forward. I believe he actually sat on the podium as I was getting off. Largely a great job, I owe you. And the fact that Alan owed me one but subsequently never gave me a working equity order. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. It's always probably time to go. <laughs> so thank you, Alan, for that. Your total avoidance of my Bloomberg's and I am's seemed frustrating at the time. Now I realize you're avoiding me for my own good. <laughs> 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 This podium in 2008, I went directly to work for the world's largest interbroker dealer in the ICAP. There were a handful of ex-city guys who went to ICAP, and so they hired me immediately. The contract I signed there paid me more money than I had ever made before in a calendar year or since. When I was first in discussions with ICAP, the guy in charge had told me uh, I would trade utilities for him, but I would go into a side office on any breaks and I would type tape report. And what we would do is we would take advantage of popularity to take report like I did at Citigroup. Because for the calendar year that I did take a report, by August I had doubled the commissions that we had done for all 2007. And then they fired me. So I kept wanting to take advantage of that, and so I was going to come on and be a trader and a lawyer. But then they put it in front of the lawyers, and the lawyers did, you know, some due diligence on me. They said we can't, we can't hire this guy. We couldn't possibly do that. So the new contract was I could come in, but I could no longer type. So that's why I gave up the. the the website. It went from a ticket report brought to you by ICAP to a situation where if I was walking down a hallway in ICAP and someone yelled, hey Large, I was contractually obligated to not turn around. So that was the death of the <laughs> So that was the death of ticket report and I had to start working for a living. As a cash equity desk at ICAP was starting to dissolve, I was offered a job as a managing director at SunTrust, where I stayed for six years before being forced to resign. In a circumstance that was probably more embarrassing than anything that has ever happened to me on the way out, even at Citigroup. I would love to talk about these scumbags in greater detail, but I believe I signed a non disclosure clause on the way out, so I'll hold my time. From SunTrust, I was immediately offered a job to join the fledgling U.S. REIT trading team at Canaccord Genuity, a Canadian firm that's represented here today. I was there for a year and a half before Canada decided to trim its U.S. presence by a certain percentage, and the whole REIT crew was let go in a last-in, first-out scenario. I was the managing director of Canaccord also, and the higher-ups were extremely gentlemanly and generous on my way out, so I hold no animosity to them whatsoever. But after the abortion that was SunTrust and then the subsequent early departure of Canaccord, I became a little gun-shy when it came time to try my hand at another shop. I met a couple of Canaccord guys there last night, and some of my closest friends, like Chris Birch, who's still on the desk there, Donnie Dillon, Mark Willen, they're all aces to me on my last layout. So when you mention this laundry list of people that I work for, I hate almost every one of them, but Canaccord's <laughs> nobody's aces in that Fortunately, after Canaccord, we had a little cushion, and I was married to a very sensible, smoking hot woman, so my wife and I decided I would take a year off to develop a plan B. Six months into that search, we almost had to enter plan AA, as now I'm almost not myself, <laughs> because we really enjoyed our time off together. Again, I mention this because I find my wife to be extraordinary, even though the powers that be here affect the death. Anyway, maybe seven months into, I was into the seventh or eighth inning going back to work. I was either going to go to uh, a macro shop uh, to be a hybrid sales trader trader, or I was going to go to an electronic trading craft. I was going to go to Renaissance Macro or ITG, and ITG was going to have me as like a sell side liaison. So they were kind of like plan A pluses, but they weren't true plan Bs. And so I wasn't really in a, a rush to jump back into those. And that's when a guy named Kevin Clancy reached out from, to me from Barstool Sports. Kevin Clancy is better known as KFC, and he's one of the original employees at Barstool. 
He's been successful on all the platforms, and he credits me as his inspiration when he left his cubicle job in some corporate office to start blogging. And that blogging gig at Barstool turned into him hosting a radio show, then having the second most popular podcast behind the Part of My Take Guys, which is run by Big Cat PMT. Kevin and I had never met, but we had mutual friends, and he'd asked me multiple times to come on do radio or podcast, and I always said no. If I got fired from Citigroup for a blog, you know, imagine what would happen if I said the C word on the radio. So I always said, you know, can't do it. But now that I was in between jobs and looking for a legitimate plan B, I tried it out and it wound up agreeing with me, and those guys thought I killed it. They got me right into an, uh, an office to meet with uh, Dave, Dave Portnoy, who's El Presidente at uh, Barstool. And David tried to hire me 10 years ago uh, when they were in Boston. He wanted me to be Barstool, New York, and quit my job at City. Um, but I turned him down soundly because I was savvy enough to know that I would be at Citigroup forever and that the shares that <laughs> shut down my third Christmas would eventually pay off. <laughs> and that Dave trying to make a company out of a blog like Barstool Sports was a losing proposition. So eight years later, Barstool gets bought by the churning group for a $100 million valuation. <clears throat> I was still stuck with City shares that almost went to zero, and City fired me out of a goddamn town. So even though I wanted out of finance, I still wouldn't have taken a position with Barstool had I thought it was Joe's house of blogs, but the churn and involvement turned it into a real company with a real sales team and real benefits. So my conversations with Portnoy were short but productive, and I soon met with their CEO, Eric Nardini, who I fell in love with and became eager to work for. They asked me for a number, and for the first time in my career, I didn't have the number. I just gave them what I thought I needed to survive because it was a new venture for me. They came back with a counter that was actually bigger than the number I gave them, which showed that they were looking to make an investment in my demographic. So I signed on to create content for them across all their platforms for one year, and the thought process is that after a year they would treat me like an athlete and I would renegotiate my contract. <laughs> my first year an athlete, first time. My first priority was to fill a brand new page for Barstool called Barstool Finance, so I was very hot out of the gate with writing long form blogs that were so random and only fleetingly related to the industry I just left, uh, left after 25 years. I wound up generating some repeat uh, content topics from Take a Report, including something called an Ask from the Past segment on Friday. That's an nostalgic look back on some of the women that shaped my youth into a fine point. <laughs> so sweet. It's a bit I borrowed from Take a Report, and back then when I did it, I felt like I was reminiscing with my peers when I would mention girls from my past. This time around, I feel like I'm introducing these new young sons of bitches to classics like Raquel Welch, Linda Carter's original Wonder Woman, or that iconic shot of Phoebe Cates leaving a pool in Fast Times Original Project, which I think everybody uh, knows very well. And surprisingly, the feedback from the 20-something crowd on these older ladies has been overwhelming. Maybe these kids are getting bored of the cookie-cutter post-Disney sex pots or the rap divas we see in the audience of VMAs. <laughs> It's tough to look at. Or maybe, <laughs> so maybe these ladies I put up in the ass for the past are just timeless. Either way, I feel like I'm handcrafting a new generation of perverts. And that is another thing that surprised the powers that be at Barstool. They originally brought me in to capture an older demographic that probably feels like dirty old men when they're looking at the chicks in the office who just so happen to be nominated for a People's Choice Awards. These are two young ladies that work on the, de on the desk in the company with me. One's 22, one's 20. They avoid me like the plague because I'm like a creepy uncle, but they legitimately could be my daughters. And they're very successful within that demographic, and so they have podcasts and radio shows and stuff, and they just ton it at such a young age. And the appeal of my blogs, according to the metrics that we were provided, seem to be equally appreciated by the 18 to 25 demo. And the blogs that I write seem to resonate most with them are the ones that I write about Wall Street and give some sort of history lesson, particularly the stories I tell on random Wall Street Wednesdays. I try to like find something that the younger generation who are sitting in their dorms or in their new offices and have a real curiosity of how Wall Street was before our whole society was neutered, and that's what I give them. <laughs> I give them a story about the funeral of a Wall Street legend like John Mulhern, and they ate it up. I told the story of my first office Christmas party, which started with me defacing a Heisman portrait of O.J. Simpson with whipped cream, which I did six months before he cut the head off his wife. So I got drunk and I put something on O.J.'s face, as if I knew. And then afterwards <laughs> that night I got robbed of eight grand on the train, somebody cut my pocket, 
and the kids eat that up. And on top of that, I try to give twisted history lessons, the ones where I, maybe I call Princess Dia a whore, or I tell the true story of how Joe Kennedy Sr. lobotomized and then abandoned his, 20, his daughter for 20 years. I show a spotlight on rock and roll pedophiles has on their iTunes account right now, and I also show a somewhat smaller spotlight on celebrities who are known to have huge penises. <laughs> <laughs>